mic on. Time to start. Oh, yeah. All right, so good to see everyone here this morning. So thankful for your presence, especially those visiting with us. We're so glad that you've come. Those that are watching online, of course, we're always glad that you're able to have that opportunity as well. We are about to start Revelation chapter 12, but I just wanted to kind of touch on Revelation chapter 11 on the sovereignty of God basically. But before we get started, we'll have a word of prayer. Our most gracious, loving, wonderful, Almighty Father, thank you so much for this life that you have given us, all the many blessings that sustains us, for all the spiritual blessings that can only be found in thy dear Son. Thank you for the watch, care, and protection through the night to allow us to, on this first day of the week, to come together in spirit and in truth to study thy word. Thank you for thy word, its truth, its simplicity, and our ability to read it, understand it, obey it, and apply it to our hearts and minds. Father, we're so thankful for so many that are here this morning, especially our visitors. We count them as an honored guest. And Father, we pray especially for those that are unable to be out. Do whatever you can to help them and comfort them and strengthen them so they can be back with us once again soon. Father, we ask thee to be with our missionaries and the world over and all they're doing to spread the borders of thy kingdom. May they be able to do that without the fear of any troubles or molestations, many persecutions, that they be able to do thy will. But Father, we're so thankful for this, uh, again, another opportunity to study thy word, to take those things that we learn and obey them to our hearts and minds. But Father, we ask thee to forgive us of our sins as we repent. Forever keep us in your love as we keep your commandments. And in the end, if we've been found faithful, give us that home in heaven. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You might have one of these noisemakers. And so we want to we want to kind of avoid that that noise this morning. So thank you. In Revelation chapter 11, John was told to measure the temple. Was this a literal temple? No. No, this is not the literal temple because it was destroyed in A.D. what? you remember? 70. That's right. A.D. 70. And nor is this any supposed restored temple at the end of the world. The temple that Ezekiel measured in Ezekiel 40 was not even a physical temple either. The temple is the true spiritual Israel, which is what? The church. That's right. The church. 
he gave him some numbers. He said three and a half. You remember what that was about? Three and a half. This is half of seven. Seven means what? Completeness. Right. Perfect. Right? Completeness. Perfection. So three and a half would mean what? Incompleteness. Right? So it's indefinite but, not, but limited. But this incompleteness may not only represent the restlessness associated with the experience, but also really the inadequacies of the enemy of God to overcome his people. Now, there were two witnesses. Was that literal? The two symbolizes strength. Not a literal number. There is great strength in the scriptures. There's great strength in the church's witnessing, proclamation of the scriptures, even in the face of adversity. And the militant spirit of the true Christians and their publication of the gospel by this would remain very strong and undeterred. Now, Revelation 11 and verse 15 would be the key verse for that particular chapter. When he says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And so we got down to, I believe, let me make sure that we are in the right area. We got down to the very last end part of Revelation 11. I want to get there. I believe it was at the end of 18, verse 18 here, where he says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them, which destroy the earth. Psalm chapter 2 and Daniel 7 actually have a very much bearing on this passage. The, the nations in their wrath tried to really to break asunder the bond that was between God and his son by putting the son to death. Satan thought he won. That he put Christ on the cross, killed the, the very son of God, but until he rose on that third day, he realized that was part of the plan. That was part of the plan. When he got exalted to God's own right hand, that's when they realized they hadn't won. And so the heathen forces, they continued to set at naught God's counsel by setting their hand against his church and his truth. But again, their defeat is assured. Now in Daniel's vision of the beast that made war against the saints and prevailed against them, the time came for judgment to be given on behalf of the saints that they might possess the kingdom, Daniel 7.22. And so the sounding of the seventh trumpet seems to really reveal the fulfillment of both the passages of Psalm 2 and Daniel 7. Psalm 2, verses 3 through 6 says, Let us break their hands asunder, their bands asunder, and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. 
Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Well, that was Jesus. That was Jesus. God's going to judge the dead. He would condemn those who were dead in sin. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 5 of Ephesians 2, he says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. So God would judge the dead, or he would judge for the purpose of blessing those who had died in the faith. Those who had died in the faith. You might remember Revelation 6, 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So God would judge the dead or he would judge it for the purpose of blessing. But God would give reward to the prophets, to the saints, to those who fear his name, whether small or great. And that's just symbolic of Christianity triumphing over the enemy. Remember, we talked about last week the very fact that, that in the end, God wins. Christians win. Christianity wins. The faithful New Testament Christians win over Satan and over the enemy. They win in the end. So that's, this is what's symbolic of that triumph. Now the reference of this verse is not to the end of time and really the final judgment, but to the victory of the church over the suppression or the oppressions of the enemy at that time. But also with that idea that in the end, God wins. So God would destroy those who destroy the earth. Now that word destroy means to change for the worse, to corrupt, Thayer tells us, to lay waste, to make havoc. The idea is not to extinguish or bring to extinction. Those who corrupt the earth would be corrupted. They would be wasted. They would be judged and punished. Pretty simple enough. All right? So now we get to verse 19. And he says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there were seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. What do you think that that would all mean? The presence of God. Right? The presence of God among his people. He never deserts his people, not even in times of persecution or even in good times. But there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hell. You see, the church today, the people, is the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Notice what he says. He says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are? Go ahead. You know, there's been a lot of events that we read about in the Bible where God's presence was shown through elements of the earth. And like one of them, when, when Jesus, you know, when he was hung on the cross, when he died, the, the temple, the curtains were torn asunder. There was, there was thunder. There was other things happening. In other words, God was there in that event. And then other, other events were... God's presence was also there. And like he's saying, you know, we're, we're a temple, temple of God here on this earth. And our presence, how we show God in our presence is by showing righteousness while we walk here on this earth. And that way, people can still see God. 
they might not see it in the elements like back in the New Testament events, but they, they see us by the way we're living. That's right. That's right. We're, we're, we are representing God and Christ on earth. We are the spiritual Israel, the church, the Lord's church. You know, the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was assurance to Israel of God's abiding presence with them. And as long as Israel remained loyal, God stayed with them. God stayed with them. And so here's the same picture being expressed, presented to us, that this gives us the ultimate assurance, as it did those in the first century. Remember, John is writing this to the first century Christians that are undergoing the persecutions of that time. And so they were, they were able to understand that this was, this was assurance to them, complete assurance, that God was going to be with them throughout all this persecution that they were having to endure. So it's, it's kind of a, a consoling vision. A consoling vision, yes. I think of the scripture in Matthew 28, 18, where he says, go forth baptizing. Yeah, all authority is given unto me in heaven. And right. Go ye right. therefore and teach on me. He says at the end of there, lo, if you do these things, you're, the church is marching on. Yeah. He'll be with us. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and and uh, yeah, that's right. Because he says, yeah, "Always be with us, even unto the end of the world." But well, what do we have to do? We have to, we have to go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew twenty-eight, nineteen and twenty. So yes, very very important to understand. There is. A, an ultimate victory, but we have to do the work for that victory to come in. Right? You can't, you can't win the race if you don't run it. You see? You can't win the race unless you run it. You know, uh, the church will be in conflict with the world, and Satan's going to persecute us even more so because he knows that he's lost us. And he doesn't want us to be anywhere in any way with God. So Satan's going to do whatever he can to bring about persecution, to draw men away from God. And he is relentless. He won't let up until he has accomplished his goal. We have to be stronger. We have to be stronger. Dan? You know, Charles, um, just like when Satan was with uh, God in his presence about Job, and Job, Satan wanted to just kill him right out. But God said, no, you can't, you can't kill him. But you can do whatever you want to in his environment he lives in. So Satan destroyed everything that was pleasing and the closest to, to Job's heart. And Satan, today, he can't directly kill us, but he can use everything around us that we cherish and turn it against us. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how he is. He's deceitful. Christ said he's the prince of this world. He knows us just as well as Jesus knows us. But the only thing that... The difference between Jesus and Satan, Jesus brings salvation after this world. Satan only keeps us in this world and the destruction of it with it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Satan's going to do whatever he can to bring us down in every way. And he's going to work on the things that, that matter to you the most. And he knows exactly where you're most vulnerable. And that's what he's going to work on. 
And so we always had to be very careful. I had a sheet back there in the back. If you have not got one, uh, just be sure and get one on the way out. It is a summary of the visions of Revelation chapter 4. And I, I started off with just doing Revelation 4 through 11 since that was what we were. But in order to, to not waste paper, I went ahead and gave you the summary of the visions from Revelation chapter 4 all the way to chapter 22. So you'll have that uh, on that sheet front and back. So be sure and, and pick that up if you haven't already because it'll just kind of help solidify what we have been talking about for the past uh, chapters there from chapter 4 through 11. And, uh, and then, of course, as we continue on in these visions, we're going to see uh, the rest of that from 12 all the way up to 22 as well. All right. Any other questions about chapter 11? Chapter 11. Well, we get to chapter 12, and here he talks about the woman and the dragon, the spiritual war in heaven. So this is the woman and the dragon episode. Now, a lot of scholars out there in the world divide the book at this point, making chapters 1 through 11 one unit and 12 through 22 another unit. And some even claim that chapters 12 through 22 is simply a repeat of the things that were taught in the first 11 chapters. Uh, here's what one of those had said, one of the commentators. He said, it is true that the writer makes a new beginning at 12 verse 1, but the reader was prepared for that by chapter 10 and verse 11, where John was told that he was to prophesy many more things to many people. The characters here are essentially the same. The conflict is the same, but it is presented under a different aspect. The outcome is still the same as was indicated in the very beginning. And it's interesting for us to see that from here to the end of the book that the action is much faster than it was before. So in climactic sequence, judgment on Rome is followed by judgment on all evil. And finally, the conflict emerges into complete victory for God and the forces of righteousness. So now we come to where there's this struggle between the woman and her offspring in opposition to the dragon and his allies, that is the first beast and the second beast. These characters, and if you didn't get the uh, glossary of, of the terms that we can find here in the book of Revelation, be sure and pick up that too because that helps give you a definition of those things that we see in this particular book. But these characters must be identified in order to, to, for us to understand the message itself. The spiritual struggle between, or that's described here, is rooted in God's ancient warning to Satan in Genesis 3.15 when he said, I will put enmity between thee and and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 of Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. So John here sees a sign. It's a miraculous wonder. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her footstool, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was with child, and she cried out in that giving birth situation. Well, who does, of whom do, did the woman represent? Well, there are so many different views of that as well. 
Interesting. Some say that the woman represents the church, but she does not fit the pattern. Uh, the, the view would have the church producing Christ. So that probably wouldn't have worked in that case. Some say that the woman represented the Virgin Mary, who brought Jesus into the world by miraculous birth. But that view puts too much emphasis on Mary, of which the, very, the Catholic Church does very much so. And the description does not fit her history either as well. Some say that the woman represents the whole Jewish nation from which Christ sprang. However, the Jewish nation rejected Christ. Okay? And another says that the woman represents the church and the man-child represents the converts that were made by the church, but new converts are a part of the church and not a separate entity. The Lord added them to the church, Acts 2.47. So they are the church. But I've looked at this and I've come to the conclusion that she represents the faithful people of the Jewish era and the remnant which remained loyal to God in the Old Testament Israel are those in the New Testament as well. The woman symbolized more than just the old covenant remnant after bearing the man child that she came to represent all of God's people. For the children are those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus there in verse 17 of this chapter as we're going to see. Remember Hebrew, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 9 15 he said, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, talking about Jesus, and that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. He goes on to say in verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 40, that God had provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So that's kind of the idea here that it's possible that she represents the faithful people of the Jewish era and the remnant would be reminiscent as being loyal to God in the Old Testament. And uh, Micah 4.10, if you want to write these down, you can look these, read these later as well. Micah 4 and verse 10. Micah 5 verses 2 and 3. And also Israel, Isaiah 66, verses 7 and 8. And that really just helps support that view that she represents the faithful people of the Old Testament era, the Jewish era. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So this vision is described as being seen from heaven, from heaven's point of view. The dragon, the principal character in this part of the vision was not in heaven but was in the vision which was being seen in heaven from heaven now who do you think that that great red dragon might signify Satan, Satan that's right alright he's called the devil in verse 9 of this text called the devil and Satan which deceived the whole world right well, this colors that he has said has really come to be a representative of certain emotions, dispositions, events. Black is grief or sorrow or wickedness. White, of course, is 
purity, victory, right? Blue, calmness, happiness. Red is what? Anger, bloodshed, blood. Yeah, bloodshed, blood, right? The scarlet woman, remember? This symbolic dragon is pictured as red. Satan was a murderer from the beginning, John 8, 44, right? Of course, seven is a symbolic of perfection, completeness. The seven heads of the dragon would symbolize the fullness of intelligence. The devil is a mastermind of craftiness and cunning. That's why he knows exactly where to hit you the hardest to bring you down. So very, very important that we see that. Now, Satan has fullness of power in his realm. And the word horn is used in the Bible to represent power and might. And so it says there that he had ten horns, seven crowns, diadems on his head. Diadem came to designate the royal headdress of monarchs that was ornamented, uh, or ornamented with the uh, gold and jewels. And that word is used here to symbolize the unholy power possessed by Satan. His ungodly influence is described by the picture of him dragging away a third of the stars. And so he awaited the birth of the woman's child so that he could destroy it as soon as it was born. You see, Satan knew from Old Testament promises that a great personage was coming from Genesis 3.15 on. He didn't know the details of God's plan. Might be a reason for that, huh? Yeah. Exactly. That's right. So he thought he was sure to defeat God by putting his son on the cross and to destroy him. But little did he realize he was actually helping to fulfill God's plan for Christ to come to seek and to save those who are lost and to die for all of mankind, to shed his blood that purchased the church, you and I, so that we could be added to it as we obey his gospel. He began to destroy, try to destroy Christ through Herod the Great, back in Matthew chapter 2, and at various other times during Christ's ministry, Luke 4, 16 through 30, and John 8, 8 58 through 59. So very important that we understand exactly what's happening. So, so many things have tried to tear Christ away from the world, though he being the redeemer, the savior of the world, and that he couldn't, he couldn't destroy God's plan. God always keeps his promises. And his word. His fighting against the church was no less severe church has always faced extreme danger. It will never reach a time on earth when Satan has lessened his attacks against it. And his assaults take various forms in the early years, as was mentioned earlier about Job. Satan used physical force. He currently uses counterfeit messages of man-made churches to lessen the influence of the Lord's church. So many out there, they all can't be right. But they all can be wrong. Right, Van? Charles, with that um, thought, in mind that you just express about the plan of salvation from God for mankind. We see the power of Christ because Christ, while he was on this earth, explained to the disciples exactly what was going to happen. So how did Satan not know? 
It was cause Christ has all authority on the earth when he was on the earth. And his will was to be done. And if he didn't want Satan to know what he told his disciples, then it was meant to be. Because Christ explained his death, burial, and resurrection throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And with that in mind, if Christ didn't want Satan to know his plan of redemption, because Satan was always there, he was always trying to get something over on Christ with the people, then the power of God through Christ must have been exhibited for what Satan could not know at that time. We need to also understand that even the disciples, when you read those books, they didn't know what Jesus was saying. When he said, I'm going, after three days, I'm going to destroy the temple, they thought he was talking about the real temple. He didn't, he didn't you know, they didn't know that he was talking about his temple in the very fact, but it would be raised again on that third day, right? He's going to destroy the temple, but then he's going to raise it on the third day, which was his life, and he would never die again. So they didn't even understand that. And I don't think that Satan really understood fully what exactly what Jesus was saying because it didn't, it didn't correspond with his thinking. Yes, Don? He told them that the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, would come and explain right. these things. John 16, 13. Yeah, he, he, he did tell them that, that there would be a time when, when the Holy Spirit would come and guide them into all truth and bring to their remembrance all the things that he had taught them for those three and a half years he was here on this earth. So there was still a lot that had to be said yeah, and to understand and know the, to the apostles, especially those 12 uh, with uh, Matthias taking Judah's place, of course. And uh, so with that idea, uh, Satan didn't know all the details. And uh, even though he might have listened to what Jesus had to say, I don't think he really understood exactly what was going to go on and how it was going to happen until it did. His goal was just to, you know, sometimes we can get to working on a goal so much that we forget all the things around us. I think Satan might have been so, so, so adamant about trying to put Christ on the cross that he kind of wasn't thinking about all the little details, you know, as well. I don't know. But um, Satan is not going to lessen his attacks against the church today. So he's going to do whatever he can to use the lusts and the weaknesses of the members to create trouble in the Lord's church. You know, the, the church in many localities in America is facing troubles even today. I mean, these include false doctrine, immorality, division, apathy, worldliness, ignorance of the scriptures, compromise. You know, there's, there's, there's this lack in, in growth, biblical knowledge and growth from God's word, some congregations are baptizing only children of members. Uh, many of the younger generation are weak and they're going into apostasy. A lot of these so-called Christian colleges are teaching false doctrines. And so that they can be legitimate in the university college aspect with the state... They have to, they're allowed, well, they have to, I don't, they don't want to be allowed, but they have to bring in sectarian professors that will teach nonsense. And so they, they're losing the effect of the truth of God's word because so many are being influenced by the outside pressures that are coming inside as well, even in the Lord's church. There needs to be a, a great revival of knowledge and spirituality and numerical growth as well. And how can it be done? Well, first, each of us need to be certain we are 
what we ought to be. If you are a New Testament Christian and you were to be put in jail, would you be convicted? That's a good question that we need to ask ourselves. Would they be able to find enough evidence to prove, yes, you're a New Testament Christian and we're going to put you under the jail? Like Paul and Silas, right? Then we need to look into our own families and making sure our own circle of friends as well that, that we're not allowing those outside influences to, to steer us away because that's where Satan's going to work. He's going to work with your friends. And we need to do all we can to impart that knowledge of truth unto them and try to lead them to salvation by our godly influence as well. Look at verses 5 and 6. And she brought forth a man child of who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So there's little doubt about the identity of the woman bringing forth a child, a man child. But these verses really describe Christ very plainly, don't they? The woman, as described in verses 1 and 2, represents God's faithful of the Old Testament era. In verse 6, she comes to represent God's faithful of this age, the church. And when Christ was exalted to heaven to sit on God's throne, the church was scattered abroad, attacked by Satan on every hand. But God was sustaining it. God was with them and he would do so for 1260 days. That's three and a half years. An indefinite period of time. Not a literal number. But an indefinite period of time. Half of the perfect complete number seven. Now this, this corresponds with Revelation chapter 11 that we just studied with the same time involved, a time of intense trial and persecution. But this, this chapter has beautifully described our first century brethren in their current situation and what they're dealing with, with that persecution happening to them. And so our time has gone, as sad as it might be. But thank you for your kind attention, your kind comments, and we'll pick up from there next week.